Here's an idea. Yang's semblance isn't a problem, but Weiss's is. During Volume 5, Yang's most prominent arc is her getting over her over-reliance of her semblance. They do this by having her run from one fight, but the success of her arc isn't our topic today. This problem of Yang relying too much on her semblance was brought up back in Volume 4, where Tai had said, Do you realize you used your semblance to win every fight after the qualifiers? And yeah, Yang uses her semblance a lot. Out of the 15 combat scenes she's been in, she's used her semblance for 9 of them. Not to mention how often she activates it during conversation. However, while Yang uses it pretty liberally, she doesn't really use it exceptionally more than anyone else. Why Yang's been singled out for her semblance while everyone else gets a pass makes no sense. When Yang brings this up in their conversation, Tai argues that not everyone else's is basically a temper tantrum, but uh, Tai's fucking wrong. First of all, while Yang does activate her semblance when she gets angry, she's also shown to keep her technical abilities. She doesn't just hulk out and shoot wildly, she's still able to think critically and execute challenging athletic feats like her Dempsey rolls. I would describe it less like a temper tantrum and more like a surge of adrenaline. Secondly, Yang is far from the only character to utilize their semblance more when they get upset or angry. We've seen a multitude of characters get angry during a fight just to kick it into high gear. Singling Yang out for this just seems odd when in the same volume, Weiss gets upset and accidentally summons a Borbatusk, and later both Hazel and Emerald freak out and overuse their semblances. Tai continues to say, It's great in a bind, but what if you miss? What then? Now you're just weak and tired. Tai seems to suggest that Yang gets one good punch in before she has to lie down to recover. Except that isn't how Yang's semblance works at all. Yang can turn her semblance on and off at will. We've seen her go berserk for a moment and then go back to fighting without it on. Even after taking out tough opponents with a super-powered semblance punch, which we've seen multiple times, Yang continues as normal. She doesn't struggle to stand or speak. The most we've seen her do is take a breath to calm herself down, but using her semblance has never been shown to tire her out. Here's the real kicker. Tai connects all this to her lost arm. You used your semblance irresponsibly, so you got tired and lost an arm. But once again, no. That did not happen. The only combat we saw Yang partake in before she encountered Adam was we saw her punch one guy in the face at a distance. Yang, for the most part, is absent during the attack on Beacon. We don't ever cut to her fighting through hordes of baddies looking for her friends or anything, implying that she's not fighting anyone. When she finds Adam, it should be assumed that she's at full HP. Yes, she activates her semblance when she charges Adam, but that doesn't negate the use of her aura. Adam cuts through her aura, her semblance has nothing to do with the fact that he dealt so much damage. If she had jumped toward him without her semblance activated, she still would have lost that arm. For some reason, the writers have arbitrarily decided that Yang needed something to overcome and chose relying too much on her semblance. I would argue that Yang should instead be focusing on fighting smarter. Don't just rush in willy-nilly, brute force won't always be the answer. Her semblance is not a problem, and forcing her to bypass it arbitrarily only hinders the character's fighting ability. It would probably be a better idea to give your characters more to work with during a fight, rather than limiting their options. However, there is one good example where adding more abilities has become a problem. Weiss. Weiss's semblance makes her quite the special little snowflake. Heh. <laughs> Not only is it a super rare hereditary one, but it also gives her a shitload of abilities. Her glyphs can support her, propel her, defend her, amplify her dust, alter the way her dust is fired, manipulate time, and summon. And Weiss loves to summon. So much so that she's forgotten all the other ways that she can fight. Before Volume 4, Weiss fights like a fencer. She stabs and strikes with her sword, utilizing her glyphs and dust as she goes. Once she learned how to summon, though, her sword has become a glorified wand. Weaknesses are interesting, but not when they're seemingly self-imposed. Why insist on summoning Armor Guy to fight Vernal when you could just do this to her? Weiss has completely forgotten her fighting style to instead focus on exclusively summoning. Weiss's over-reliance on summoning is clear while watching the show, making it seem like she's the one who should be learning to use her semblance more sparingly. One could assume Archie was setting up Weiss's summoning problem with all this, but I really don't think so. Characters have the tendency to sit down and tell each other what their problems and weaknesses are, rather than just let those be clear from their actions. If they intended for Weiss to learn to summon less, someone would have brought it up by now. They seem to have simply accidentally set up Weiss to having a problem without choosing to acknowledge it. Weiss can't learn to stop relying on her semblance so much, that's the arc they chose for Yang to go through. Which brings me to my next point. The writers have the tendency to just pick a problem for a character seemingly arbitrarily. Yang lost an arm and showed signs of PTSD. They set up those as potential arcs for Yang to go through, but instead just chose to have her stop using her semblance so much. Why? 
why insert a new problem for Yang to deal with when your script and story have organically introduced some? Weiss relies on her summoning too much. We've seen that displayed with her fight against Vernal, so why not let that be incorporated into the story? These aren't the only examples of ignored organic weaknesses. Weiss tends to prioritize herself when blocking, often causing other people to get hurt instead. That was on clear display during her fight with the Lancers, but it's never brought up again. Ruby rushes into combat. She's often running ahead of her team, leaving herself without aid. From charging the Deathstalker to ignoring Crow to fight Tyrion, Ruby hasn't learned when it's a good idea to run from a fight. No one on Team Juniper have electric bullets to give Nora a power boost, choosing to instead just wait around for a thunderstorm. And even later, Ruby only shoots Nora with electricity once. The kids need to develop better strategies to let Nora utilize her semblance more. Jean's shield isn't used well. He defends his torso despite the fact that's the only part of him with armor on. Jean needs to learn how to shield properly to defend his weak points like his head or legs better. Ren's weapon do so little damage that they don't seem to be effective. Ren's been most successful in combat when he's unarmed or using a simple knife. Ren either needs to get a weapon upgrade or change his fighting style to better accommodate for his ability with small blades. All of these have been made clear naturally through the character's actions, and they've all been ignored. Rooster Teeth are actually very good at setting up problems for the kids to overcome, but it must be by accident because they never get touched by the writers, who instead arbitrarily pick problems for the kids to face. They don't pay any attention to the issues they've built up naturally into the script, but rather insert disconnected new problems out of nowhere. Yang just had to get a new arm and might be struggling to adjust to this new life. But never mind that, she uses her semblance sometimes and that's bad. Jean's emotions get out of hand when Pierre is brought up or when facing her killer, and it would be smart for him to learn to keep those in check. Meh, his fighting ability isn't as good as the kids who've been training since birth, let's focus on that. I call these inserted weaknesses arbitrary because they really do seem to have just picked a problem out of a hat and called it a day. A good example of that? Ruby. Ruby struggles with hand-to-hand -hand combat, and that's treated like some big flaw she needs to conquer. Fucking why? Of course Yang's better at this than Ruby. It's Yang's preferred fighting style. It'd be like if people got on Blake's case for not being able to fight for the scythe. Duh, that's not what she trained for. Ruby should not have to learn to fight better at hand-to-hand, -hand, because if Ruby doesn't have Crescent Rose, then she could just run away. Her semblance is super speed. She's specifically designed to be able to escape from combat situations that's too dangerous. Everyone's insistence that Ruby needs to learn how to keep fighting if she's disarmed directly works in tandem to Ruby's problem of rushing into combat when she shouldn't. Ruby needs to learn how to run away, but instead the writers force Ruby to pursue bad habits and stick around even when she's unarmed. Not only is this an inserted weakness, but it's also also a bad one. Why is Ruby also the only one where this is a problem? Weiss drops Martin Astor all the time. Why isn't she being called out for her hand-to-hand -hand abilities? In fact, almost all of the main cast heavily rely on their weapons, and aside from Ren, Yang, and Sun, would probably do poorly with just fisticuffs. Ruby's weakness is something everyone has, but no one else has to deal with. And that's another thing. Weaknesses and flaws are seen as an obstacle to overcome, rather than something for the characters to work around. While it is good to present your characters with problems to conquer, not every character flaw should be treated this way. Ruby's poor hand-to-hand -hand fighting is treated as something she needs to get better at. Characters' flaws are interesting and offer dimensions to their range of ability. Why simply have Ruby suddenly get good at fisticuffs when having Ruby work around her weakness would be more thought-provoking. Ruby can't do hand-to-hand -hand well, so instead of having her become a boxing champion, have her insist on bringing Crescent Rose to inappropriate events, just in case. Have her craft some sort of belt or harness so her sight's always attached to her. Have Ruby load herself up on a bunch of small hidden weapons so she can take pot shots at enemies while she makes a break for Crescent Rose. Weaknesses don't need to simply be overcome, but rather are far more interesting if they are permanent problems the characters must face and work around. Not to mention that having your characters continually conquering their flaws means you're also continually throwing new ones at them to face, or leaving them perfect with no way to grow. Weiss needs to learn how to work better with others. She did. Now she has to stop being so racist. She did. Now she has to learn to summon. She did. Now she has to learn to control her summoning. She did. Now she has to stand up to her dad and stop doing what he tells her to do. She did. Weiss is constantly getting over some character flaw, and now she kinda has nothing to do. I mean, the writers could focus on her summoning problem, but they probably won't. Which means Weiss has no character weaknesses. No matter who or what she's facing, no matter what their abilities are, no matter the terrain, Weiss is on an even playing field against everyone. Which means Weiss and the writers don't have to think about the circumstances of combat. There are no unique or interesting tactics Weiss needs to employ during combat, because she doesn't struggle with any element that could be presented to her. 
they've rendered Weiss's combat tactics boring. They actually do have a character with an established flaw that hasn't been presented as something they need to get better at, but it might be because they forgot about it. Yang struggles against people who kick. Apparently. I had thought Milsha was just a weenie, but during the director's commentary they explained that Yang has a tougher time with people who use kicks, and that's why Melanie lasted longer against her. That's why Yang's always fighting Mercury in the openings, that's why they insist that this pair-up is tense. Except Yang does nothing different when fighting these kickums. They set up this obstacle but don't ever have the characters acknowledge it. If Yang has so much trouble against people like Mercury, why doesn't she fight defensively, or attempt to avoid these conflicts, or maybe lose sometimes? Yang's fought Melanie and Mercury and hasn't lost to either of them once. Yeah, Neo kicked a lot, but it was her ability to dodge and redirect Yang's momentum that landed her a victory. And now she's gone, so it's not like Yang can improve to beat her in a rematch or something. The writer's ability to set up flaws for the characters is downright impressive. There's a whole treasure trove of potential growth and intrigue represented through the characters' actions that simply go ignored. They pass over all the well-established potential arcs and just pick a random new thing for the characters to confront. Their insistence on throwing out-of-the-blue hurdles at the cast results in arcs with no setup and no real visible payoff. Establish a problem we've never seen before and consider acting upon that once successful growth. Every weakness is presented as something to overcome, rather than a problem to work around, resulting in characters constantly getting new issues thrown at them or stagnating with no weaknesses to think about. RT needs to realize that having your characters struggle with something is good and shouldn't just be seen as something for them to get better at. Watching your characters overcome situations with their problems is more entertaining than watching them just overcome the root of the problem. Giving them weaknesses presents situations that act like puzzles for them to solve. Having them conquer all their weaknesses just means having a couple of scenes where they struggle with their issue and then suddenly get good at it forever, ruining all the tension it could have provided. It would be great if RT could zero in on the organic flaws of the cast and let them develop naturally, show the characters fumble and later have that character plan accordingly so as to not fumble again. Let us see their growth, don't just tell us they have a problem we've never seen before. It's satisfying to watch characters actively change their tactics so as to better accommodate for their flaws and previous mistakes. But unfortunately, as it is now, that happening doesn't seem very likely. Ruby's writers insert arbitrary flaws onto the characters while foregoing the organically introduced ones they've set up. Yang's semblance isn't a problem, but Weiss's is.